Father, we thank you and praise you that your faithfulness of old is new every morning. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us to trust you and to know you, and we pray that you would give us wisdom. We pray that you would cause us to live before you in a way that honors you. And we ask that you'd use Psalm 39 to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been listening to this book called All the Light We Cannot See. And the book is set in in Germany and France, and it traces a blind French girl and a young German boy who winds up in what amounts to like a military boarding school. And it really brings out the culture of World War II Germany and the way that the Nazis were able to deform and abase and brutalize everything there. And um, it, it, was, it struck me when Matt thanked the Lord for the joys of ordinary life because one of, one of, the, one of the things that develops in that book is there's a, there's a minor character who is one of the boys at this boarding school with this other main character. And that minor character, he loves birds. And he can recognize the sound of all kinds of birds. Even if he doesn't see them, he can identify what it is. And, and he has this unique ability, this gift. But he's small and weak. And they play this contest at the school, who's the weakest? And they essentially chase the weakest down and then pummel him. And eventually this boy is so broken that his mind no longer functions. And, and, and so it really brings out the way that the Nazis, they valued a certain kind of strength, they valued a certain kind of giftedness, but there were other things that they didn't value. We should praise God for the joys of ordinary life, for the fact that we live in a culture that doesn't impose those kinds of totalitarian, totalitarian values on our children. The, the book, what, the reason I'm telling you about this book is because one of the things that, uh, that really came out as I, as I listened to it, the, the, the book starts when these characters are children. They're, they're not yet 10 years old in the 1930s. And then by 1945, they're between the ages of 15 and 20. And then those who live through the war, by 1974, they're between the ages of 40 and 50. And then the book ends in 2014 when the characters are in their mid-80s. And, and it's so brief. It happens so fast. And there's one, so connected to that, the brevity of life, there's one particular scene in the book where this French girl, she's hiding from a German soldier. And this German soldier, he suspects that someone is in the house, but he doesn't, he can't hear her, he can't see her, he can't find her. She's very well concealed. But he's a very patient man, and he waits. And four days go by. And, and this, this girl has been silent in this home for four days. And she knows that German soldier is down there, and she can't take it anymore. And finally, she turns on the music. It, it's, it's, it illustrates the way that, that often, even if we commit ourselves to silence, we reach a point where we cannot maintain our silence. And those are relevant. Those considerations are relevant because of what we'll see in Psalm 39. I would invite you to open your Bible this morning to Psalm 39, and we will make our way through this psalm. There's, a, there's an outline in your bulletin, and I want to begin by just sort of drawing, some attention, drawing your attention to some things within the psalm that help us to see how its, its divisions of thought fall out. So if, if you see in verse 1, David says, I said I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. And then if you drop your eyes down to the end of verse 3, David says there, then I spoke with my tongue. So all of verses 1 through 3 is really about David's commitment to silence, which he can't maintain. He, he eventually reaches a place where he's got to speak. And then he, he speaks in verses 4 through 6. But surprisingly, he doesn't address the wicked who have been provoking him. 
Instead, he speaks to the Lord. And what he contemplates is how brief his life is. So he's asking there in verse 4, make me know my end. Then he speaks of how fleeting he, he is. And then he, he goes on to talk about how mankind stands as a mere breath. So there's this, this emphasis on how, how life is vain because it's so short and it's over so quickly. And then if you look at verse 7, verses 7 through 11 are about David's hope. And he says in verse 7, my hope is in you. And what he's specifically hoping for is in verse 8, to be delivered from all his transgressions. And then in verses 12 and 13, he, he's got this final appeal to the Lord. He's, he's reminding the Lord, I'm just a sojourner here. I'm just passing through, so to speak. And so he asks the Lord to look away from him. And, and we'll consider what that means as we, as we go through the psalm. But those are the four sections of the song. Silence, the vanity of life, the hope that David has, and then the fact that he's a mere sojourner. That's what we'll see as we continue through this psalm. As we, as we approach it, um, let, me, let me draw your attention to the way that David has been dealing with wicked adversaries, in some ways all the way uh, back, reaching all the way back to Psalm 34. If you remember uh, the superscription of Psalm 34, it says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. And, and if you remember the story from Samuel, the reason that David is with Abimelech is because Saul's trying to kill him. So, so I think that, that sort of controls that superscription, this context of Saul persecuting David, trying to kill David, and David having to flee his own nation. This is sort of informing all of these psalms. So look at 35.1. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. The king of Israel is fighting against him. And all his soldiers are trying to kill him. And then 36.1. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Saul thinks, the Lord has anointed David, but I can kill him. Which is really arrogant, isn't it? But, the, but the, the thought that he can overcome David is resonating with Saul's heart, and he thinks he can accomplish it. And then it's as though in Psalm 37, 1, David is consoling himself in response to these evildoers who are trying to kill him. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. And then down at verse 7 of Psalm 37, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And then look over at Psalm 38 in verse 15, but for you, O Lord, do I wait. So in all these psalms, the wicked are surrounding David. They're making plots on his life. And he's saying, I'm waiting for you, Lord. Now look at Psalm 39. And um, uh, it's, it's interesting to consider this superscription to the choir master to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. This guy, Jeduthun, He's actually mentioned a number of times in the Bible, and, he, and yet he's not a character that we know at all. Um, he, he's mentioned seven times in 1 Samuel, another three times in Chronicles, and at least three times in the Psalms. He's in this, this superscription and then in Psalm 62 and 77. He's one of the Levites that David installed over the worship in the house of the Lord after the ark rested in Jerusalem to Jeduthun. So I think that indicates to us that David has perhaps written this, Psalm 39, to Jeduthun after he's come through this period. Once he's passed the difficulty that Saul presented in his life, and now he's reigning as king, and the ark rests in Jerusalem, and this guy Jeduthun is one of the worship leaders in the tabernacle, and David writes this psalm reflecting on this earlier period in his life. And he, and he says here in verse 1, I said... I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. So he's guarding himself in two ways. He's guarding his ways, his way of life, and he's guarding his mouth. But really they're the same because the reason he's guarding his ways there at the first line is so that he doesn't sin with his tongue. And it would appear that the wicked who are surrounding him are those that he's particularly concerned that he not give them, he not speak words that they're going to use bullets to aim back at him. So maybe you've had 
people in your life this way, that, that you know that anything you say can and will be used against you. You, you know that whatever you say to these people, they are just going to load up their weapons and shoot it back at you. And, and so you recognize that the best thing to do is just to close your mouth. You, you can't talk to these people. This is what David is, is dealing with. He says, I'm going to guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. And then he says in verse 2, I was mute and silent. I held my peace. And then the, the ESV renders the, that next line of verse 2 there. I held my peace to no avail. Other translations take that a little bit differently, like the this HCSB and the NAS. They both say something like, I held my peace even from speaking good. So even good things David is not communicating because he's surrounded by these adversaries. And then at the end of verse 2 there, he says, And my distress grew worse. I wonder if you've been in a situation like this. I, just this week, I feel like I was in a situation like this, where things are being said, and, and I feel like I have a lot to say in my mouth, a lot to say in my heart, lots, a lot of things I want to communicate, but I know that the people listening are, we're, we're not in, a, in a, a, a cordial, harmonious relationship. We're in an adversarial relationship. And so I know that anything that I say is not going to be helpful. And yet, look at, look at what David says here. My distress grew worse. The more you hold it in, the more it wants to come out. And then he says in verse 3, my heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. So he's provoked within himself. And finally, at the end of verse 3, he says, then I spoke with my tongue. So he reaches this place, like that girl in the attic, where he's, she's got to turn on the music. He's got to speak with his tongue. But surprisingly, what David does is not to answer the arguments of the wicked. What David does here is so instructive for us and so wise and good and helpful for us. Here, here's the dynamic of what's going on in this psalm. It's as though David says to himself, okay, I'm in the prime of my life right now. I'm surrounded by these wicked people who are trying to kill me. Anything I say they're going to use against me. When I'm 50, this will all be forgotten. When I'm 75, this will no longer be a concern to me if I live that long. And, and I don't know if there are people in your life who provoke you. Maybe they snatch from you things that belong to you. Maybe they say words that make you angry and you feel a need to lash out against them and you just want to knock their head off. You can think to yourself, if I live to be 89, this incident will not matter at all. When David begins to speak, here in verse 4, he speaks not to the wicked who surround them, surround him. He speaks to the Lord. He says in verse 4, O Lord, make me to know my end. Now, here in verse 4, David wants to know three things. Make me to know my end, that's the first. And what is the measure of my days, that's the second. Let me know how fleeting I am. And there's a, there's a nice logical relationship between those things. Because if David knows his end, well, he knows how far is between there and where he is. He'll have the measure of his days. And if he has his end and the measure of his days, he'll know how transient he is, how quickly those are going to go by. And this prompts him to say, there in verse 5, behold, you have my, made my days a few handbreadths. It's, it's as though there, maybe you've, you've heard people uh, give the height of a horse. The horse was so many hands tall. Maybe you've come across references like this. They're, they're measuring things by the breadth of the hand. And David is saying, all my life is just a few handbreadths before you. Uh, I read one author who said you could, you could measure the span of our lives in inches before the eternal, everlasting God. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. As I, I thought about this this morning, I was thinking about uh, the fact that we've, we've, we've been here at Kenwood almost seven years now, seven years in April, and I was thinking about all that's passed here 
in that short time. Seven years, and we've had two children, and our oldest has gone from being five to 12. And uh, Andrew, when we came, or when Andrew first came, uh, he's 16 now. He was nine. He was Jed's age. That's amazing how quickly life passes. There was a Sunday, I think it was 2009, when Matt and Paul were baptized on the same Sunday. And, and, and you know, there were, there were these wonderful, beloved, cherished saints here. Geneva Bishop and Marjorie Myers. And uh, there, was a, there was an evening, um, an Easter service one, one year when Dolores Miller shared her testimony. As we sang, I was thinking about this, this this morning. And Dolores, as she shared her testimony, she sang a song that, that spoke of, of how loved she felt by the Lord. And as Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says, the songbirds go quiet as we get older. Life is short. Life goes quickly. In, in what David begins to say now, here in, in the middle of verse 5, he begins to communicate how quickly life goes. The ESV renders this, surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. But this is poetry, and in poetry, often uh, the, a, a poet will decide to use a word that has multiple meanings because he wants this to operate at several levels. And you're probably aware of the fact that the word often rendered man or mankind in the Bible is simply the word Adam or perhaps pronounced Adam. So there's, a, there's an overtone, a connotation here, a poetic link up with Adam. And, and, and I think you could, you could validly um, take it as a, as a reference to Adam here. And then the word that's rendered breath is the word able. And so one way to translate this, to, to try to bring this out, might be to say something like, surely every Adel, Abel, every Adam stands before Yahweh. Now what does, that invo- what does that evoke for us? Well, why is life short? Life is short because Adam sinned. And Adam's sin resulted in things like the murder of Abel, whose life was like a breath, because he was cut short before his time. And, and then at the end of verse 5 there, what might be a, an invitation to pause and reflect, Selah, contemplate Adam's sin. Contemplate what's going to bring about the death of every one of us in this room unless Christ returns. Contemplate the way that all of us have an able like life. It's short, it's over quickly, it's brief. And then verse 6 The ESV renders this, surely a man goes about as a shadow. But here again, there's a a connotation because this particular word that's translated shadow is the very same word used in Genesis when the Lord says, come let us make man in our image. And, And so a shadow is something that happens when the light shines on you and there's an image of you on the ground there. That's, I think that's why they take it shadow here. An image is something that when you look in a mirror, you see a reflection of that thing. And, and so the word image here, I think, links up with Adam and Abel to say something like, man goes about in the image of God. And life is short because of what Adam did, like the life of Abel. And then he continues there in verse 6, surely... For nothing, they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. Um, as I was thinking about this text this week, there was a story in the, in the paper on Friday about James Garfield, 20th president of the United States of America. And um, Garfield was assassinated. He was shot twice. But it was essentially through the incompetence of the doctors around him that resulted in his death two and a half lo- months later. And uh, this, this uh, article says of him that um, Garfield was an extraordinary, charismatic, fiercely intelligent man who might have been one of our greatest presidents. This guy, he was the youngest of five children. He was, he was named James because his parents had had another child named James who had died in infancy. 
So he was the youngest of five, and he grew up in a log cabin. The article says he grew up on the raw edge of poverty, and yet he rose to be a president of the United States of America. And then they note that, that what's remarkable to us about James Garfield was, quote, the epic national grief that erupted at Garfield's passing. His funeral was larger than Lincoln's. His body traveled over train tracks strewn with flowers, largely relegated to obscurity now. Garfield was not just heroic, but beloved. What's really remarkable, the author concludes, is how completely we've forgotten. President of the United States of America, fiercely intelligent, epic national grief, and barely thought of it all today. Surely, for nothing, they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. How quickly our lives pass. So David starts contemplating the wicked and the way that he's trying to keep himself silent in verses 1 through 3, and then he turns to consider how quickly life passes in verses 4 through 6. And I think that, I think that reflection on death, the end of his life, has probably prompted him to probe the nature of his hopes. You know, when you, when you, get, reflect, when you get into a reflective mood like this, and, and there's trouble around you, and then you begin to think about the span of your life, you, you, you're sort of boiled down to where you begin to see the essence of things. And, and I think that prompts this question that David addresses to the Lord in verse 7, And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? What am I really living for? What is it that I really want? And I think the brevity of his life, has it's the realizing these things, it's like the, it's purged away all these vain, charming things. And in place of all of that, David says, my hope is in you. All I, all I really want when you strip everything else away, when you show me my end and the measure of my days and how fleeting I am, my hope is you. And, and I think something else has been impressed upon him, and that is that more than the trouble of the wicked that David is dealing with, David has come to realize that it is his sin that will kill him. More than the, the, the problem of the persecutors, David's got problems with his standing before God. And I think that's why he says in verse 8, Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. Deliver me from all my transgressions. The problem with individual sins is that they begin to become habits. And the problem with habits is that they are hard to break. Sin has power over us. And I think David is, is asking to be delivered from the power of that sin, that transgression. And also, he's asking to be delivered from the consequences of that sin. That's in that line, do not make me the scorn of the fool. Um, here again, you've got multiple poetic nuances because the word fool here is Nabal. Do not make me the scorn of Nabal. You remember that guy? Nabal was that contemptible man that David encountered back in the narratives of 1 Samuel. Uh, and, and even his wife said of him, his name is fool and he is a fool. That, that, that's who Nabal was. Do not make me the scorn of Nabal. It's no fun to be mocked. It's no fun to be um, the object of someone's scorn. It's even worse if the people mocking you are contemptible. If the people mocking you are these despicable characters. That is even more appalling. And that's what David, David is saying, Lord, I need you to deliver me from my transgressions so that wicked people like Nabal don't mock me. That, that's one way this could be taken. Another way, do not make me the scorn of the fool. Well, if David continues in transgressions, if he's not delivered from their power, what's going to happen is he's going to be a fool. He, and he's going to be reproach himself. So I think this can be taken 
multiple ways here where David is intentionally saying, I don't want people like Nabal to scorn me, and I don't want to be like people like Nabal. I don't want to be scornful. Sin, sin puts us in danger of the scorn of the fool. We don't want to be fools bearing reproach, nor do we want fools reproaching us. And the only way to avoid that is to have the prayer that David offers there at the first part of verse 8 answered. Deliver me from all my transgressions. That's our only hope. And then look at verse 9. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Now he's silent. Now he's silent. And, and now the silence has been wrought in him in a way that he could not have worked it in himself. What has brought this about? The Lord has brought this about. Now... David is not, verses 1 through 3, David was, was, he was mute and he was silent, but he was distressed and his heart was hot within him. But now he's, verse 9, he's mute and, and he's not opening his mouth because he recognizes God's work. And he recognizes that he stands before God. This is, this is the response of a man who fears God. And he's come to a place where he knows, far more important than the fact that I'm in the presence of these wicked is the fact that I'm in the presence of God. And before him, I have nothing to say. And before him, I can hold my peace. And I can let him work against these wicked. Verses 10 and 11 are going to inform verse 13. David says in verse 10, Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. This links, links up with, uh, back in chapter 39 at the end of verse 2, your hand has come down on me. And the word that's translated stroke in 39.10 is the same word that's rendered plague in 39.11. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague. So it's linking these psalms together. And, and so now David is saying, deliver me from my transgressions and take away the discipline. Your hand is heavy upon me. Your stroke, the plague, it's on me. I'm spent. I've had it. Take it away. Verse 11, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Uh, this, this, this imagery, um, I think, I think the, the moth is what is being uh, melted or consumed here. And, and look, we, we should get our arms around what David is saying. Um, I would suggest that what, what David is saying is something like, um, God will cause um, the, the sinful desire to melt like a moth. So the what is dear to him, I would interpret in this context, to, to refer to things that David sinfully desired. And David is saying, when you bring your discipline into my life, you make what I desire melt like a moth. Have you ever, have you ever caught a moth in your hand? Did you see what happened to its wings if you closed your hand around it? You open your hand and it has disintegrated in your hand. There's nothing left of the thing. It, it's like it melts against the slightest contact. It it disintegrates. It won't withstand any contact. It won't endure for any length of time. And thus are all the things that make for sinful pleasure. The diminishing joy melts into the shameful rut of addiction, and in the end, no happiness remains in that soul-sapping sin. And so David captures this, I think, in this poetic image. He says, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what he desired or what is dear to him. It's as though he's saying, your discipline removes the desire for 
those insubstantial things that I now see to be worthless. And then he concludes verse 11 with a very similar statement that we saw at the end of verse 5. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. And again, we have here mankind, Adam, breath, Abel. All men will experience life as a vapor, like Abel, because all men descend from Adam. What can David do in response to these things? But cry to the Lord as he does in verses 12 and 13. Uh, and and in, in this prayer, what, what David is going to do is three times in verse 12, he's going to request to be heard. Three different times and three different ways. Look at verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry, and hold not your peace at my tears. It's three different ways of saying, listen to this prayer that I'm making before you. The repetition communicates urgent desperation. David has come to the place where all he can do is beg the Lord to hear his prayer. These are emotional pleas. And, And that third request, hold not your peace at my tears. Why, why is he crying? Well, probably sorrow over his sin. Sorrow that he, that he sold his soul, as it were. He traded his happiness for something that melted like a moth, something that was so worthless. And, and probably also pain over what he's suffering at the hand of the Lord. Frustration that the wicked seem to prevail. So he makes those three requests to be heard, and then he gives the Lord a reason for hearing him. And this reason, here in verse 12, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. That reason is, it's almost like a declaration of allegiance. Because what David is saying is, I'm I'm just on the way to a better place. I'm not putting down roots here. These statements contrast David with those that he described back in Psalm 17 when, when, he, when he spoke of those whose portion is in this life. And David is saying, that's not my identity. I'm a pilgrim on the way. I'm, I'm sojourning to a better land of promise where the one that he will address as my Lord in Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until... I make your enemies your footstool. David, I think, conceives of himself as on the way to the land where his Lord will rule. And he's feeling the shame and the folly of his sin, and he wants to be delivered from its consequences. And so he's asking the Lord not to be silent because he's identifying himself as one who belongs to the Lord. David is saying, I'm not a citizen here. I'm a citizen of your kingdom. I'm a participant of your covenant. That's where I belong. So these prayers that David is offering, they reveal what he believes. If David didn't believe that the Lord could answer these requests, he wouldn't offer them. He wouldn't write them down. David believes that sin is going to earn him death. But he believes that God can deliver him from the power of his sin and from its consequences. Deliver me, verse 8, from all my transgressions. David also believes that God is just and God is going to punish transgression. And so for the Old Covenant context, I think we we supply to understand the rationale. David believes in the, the, the sacrificial system, the sacrifices that were offered to pay the penalty for sin. And I, I'm inclined to think he also understands that that's pointing forward to something better, which we know as the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. If you're not here, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're not a believer here this morning, we would invite you to consider that your life can be measured in handbreadths. The span of your life is as nothing before the Lord. And is this, is this what you're living for? Is this all there is? Wouldn't you like to live for something more, something beyond this life? David says, I'm a sojourner with you, a sojourner with you. David is saying, I'm passing through and I'm in your presence. 
I'm a guest like all my fathers. He's identifying himself with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the faithful of the ages who were on this pilgrimage. And then he comes to verse 13 where, we sa- where he says, look away from me. Now, I think the, the, um, that, that's literally what the text says, look away from me. But the, the HCSB uh, translates this in such a way that I think it brings out in particular what, what David means here, and it translates it, turn your angry gaze from me. So David is not asking the Lord to, to withdraw his presence. What David is saying is, don't look at me with that wrathful look in your eye anymore. Turn your angry gaze away from me. And this is in keeping with verse 10. Remove your stroke from me. Uh, I'm spent by the hostility of your hand. You've made your point. You can st- please stop disciplining me now, is what David is saying. And if the Lord will do that, He says that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. So if the Lord will remove his wrathful look from David, David will be able to enjoy his life before the brief sojourn ends. There's much to enjoy in this life. There's the song of birds. There's the sound of music. There's there's a hearty congregation. This is older language, singing lustily to the Lord. That's a good use of that word. There's there's the joy of fellowshipping together over the Lord's table. There's the rejoicing that comes when someone passes under the waters of baptism. The ordinary joys of life and the walk of faith. This is what David wants to enjoy. In verses 1 through 3, David pledged to be vigilant about his life so that he wouldn't sin, particularly in in the things that he spoke in the hearing of the wicked, David's greater son succeeded in guarding his way against every sin. And when he was before the shearers, he was a sheep that was silent. In verses 4 through 6, David contemplates this brief walk that the sons of Adam, who bear the image, are taking before the Lord. The eternal one was crucified after a brief public career in his early 30s. In verses 7 through 11, we see that David suffered a plague and blows and uh, this this shame that, that resulted from the sins that he had committed. The Holy One was stricken and smitten and afflicted for the sins of his people. David cried out to the Lord in verses 12 and 13, asking that the Lord would turn his angry gaze away. And the Father turned his back on Jesus altogether, prompting the God-forsaken cry. David speaks of his own experience in Psalm 39, but his own experience is a pattern of events that finds its fullest expression in the one who fulfilled every good thing that David typified. This is our king. Our king is Jesus. And he died for us. Let's pray. Father, we ask for wisdom and we have your word open before us. You have been so good to us. Lord, would you cause the knowledge of our end and the sight of the few handbreadths between here and there to make us people who are able to Count it all joy when we face trials. And Lord, when we lack that wisdom, would you enable us to ask you and believe, knowing that that those who ask in faith please you. And Father, would you indeed Deliver us from the power and the consequence of our transgressions because Jesus suffered in our place. Your angry gaze was not turned from him. And because of that, we praise you. You can turn it away from us. Lord, we ask that you would help us to live in such a way and speak in such a way that those who don't know you would see our lives and long to have you with them as you are with us.
by your mercy, by your grace, in the name of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.